Howdy, Mr. Pete here, and welcome back to Studio B. And the subjects of this video and several that will follow it, it's all about dividing heads or index heads. Now, I've had this Hardinge index head for many, many years. I got it from my brother. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But it's pretty banged up and there are parts missing, so I am in the process of replacing it. Matter of fact, I have replaced it. I will show you my brand new Vivor dividing head BS0 in just a second here and yes they have provided it free for promotional purposes and should you be interested in it they're around 250 bucks there is information down in the description there is a link and there is a discount code if you want to take advantage of that so first of all let me talk about this and then we're going to get the uh, the Viver out and take a look at it and compare the two. I will not be doing any actual chip making or cutting in this video that will be saved for several follow-up videos. Well my brother gave me this dividing head about 20 years ago and originally it came from LP High School where both my dad and my brother taught so he bought this from the school or they trashed it or whatever in about 1969 when he also bought the green South Bend lay that you have seen in several other videos of mine. And what makes this so different from uh, most dividing heads is that it has a 4 to 1 ratio instead of 40 to 1. And that's why I really wanted to move into the Vivor because 99% of dividing heads apparently are 40 to 1 and not 4 to 1. As you know hardened equipment is the highest of quality so I do hate giving this up but as I show you all of the things wrong with this I think maybe you might understand it. Now it's not totally complete however I do have four index plates here including the one that's already mounted so we got everything we need there but it never did have a tailstock, or it did when I was a student. I don't know what happened to it. This is not the correct tailstock. I bought this from Grizzly, and it, it's adequate, but it's not great. I would love to have had the, uh, the original. Just lost along the way. All right, what else is different about this? Well, it's got a three-jaw chuck here, and this chuck has battle scars on it. I mean, it's been used for years by high school students. This possibly even has war surplus from the Second World War, but it's certainly 60, 70, or 80 years old. So the chuck is an odd thread. It's strictly uh, from a hard inch, as you can see. And this will hold 5C collets but it has long been missing the drawbar. I never did have the drawbar, but it will take 5C collets, which is something a little bit different compared to the other brands. And as you can see, without an ad adapter, the collet will fit in there, and then the, the very, very short drawbar went in from this end, and it had that original, uh, if you know what I'm talking about, it cup on the end of it that used the, the hardened spanner wrench. Some of you know what I'm talking about. In a video some time ago I made this thread protector with a brass screw. There's no thread here. It just goes over the hardened spindle here to protect it while you're using it for other operations. And at one time there was a special center that went in here that I believe it was on a 5C collet. And uh, it was just all one piece and was held in by the drawbar, if I remember correctly. I used this foot dividing head when I was a senior in high school or maybe a junior. And this is the very actual dividing head that my brother used to machine the cylinder for the Colt Navy that he made while we were in high school. And there is one of my anecdotal videos on that about the missing revolver that Jan made. It was stolen at Ford Motor Company uh, exhibit in Detroit. So go back and look at that video if you think that might interest you. But I think now you have a little idea of why I'm phasing this out and I probably will sell it at uh, Arnfest in the fall of 2025. But if you take a look 
at the, this chuck, look at the battle scars on it, where the, the students ran the cutters into the chuck. So it's really beat up, and one other thing was missing, and that is the extra jaws are long, long gone. And thank you to Viver for sending this, and I've already taken it out because I know that you hate to watch unboxings, because I sure do. So let me set this aside and bring up the brand new Viver. But first I'll show you the label on the end of the box. Well, here's the specifications on the outside of the box, but in fact, Viver calls it the BS0 because I believe the pattern of the general and the general principles of the dividing head were the design of Brown and Sharp many, many years ago. The others that may be a little different than this, I believe, are based on the Cincinnati. And here it is, right out of the box, and it sure was well packed and, believe me, well oiled. Well, what else came with it, you're probably thinking. Well, there's a total of three index plates, two right there, and of course the third one is already mounted on the device. A beautiful tailstock that belongs with this, and it's sized to match, so I'm glad to get that. And by the way, there are keys provided in the little bag here, one of the little bags, and they need to machine, be machined slightly to fit the T-slots in my bridge board. So there's four of them, two for the tailstock and two for the dividing head itself. And it came equipped with a very nice five inch three jaw chuck and there are the reverse jaws. Brand new. Not missing. But the interesting thing is, well I'm going to take it off, but first of all here's a nice chuck key, but it did have the safety spring on there. I immediately took it off because I'm not worried about safety because this chuck does not rotate on the dividing head, so there is no danger. However, the interesting thing is that I might need to put this back on because this chuck will fit an Atlas or a South Bend or a Logan Lay that's a one and a half by eight thread, a very common thread. Let's take this over to my Atlas and see if it fits, which I know it will, and secondly, how accurate is this chuck? It's a nice looking chuck. Now do, this is made in China of course and it did come with the usual bad directions that uh, Chinese goods usually have and I'm not sure why they got all these different model numbers because BS0 really is the number I go by but be sure and check that out. Well I'm over on my Atlas Craftsman 12 inch lathe and the dividing head chuck fits perfectly and I put an indicator against a uh, shaft here and it runs within one and a half thousand so that is the best chuck that I've got for this lathe believe it or not so that's quite a bonus well wasn't that amazing that this not only fit on my other machines but it's very very accurate you know most of the time a three jaw chuck is several thousands off even when it's brand new so this is a, a nice chuck and it came with a thread protector which should always be put onto the thread when the chuck is not on there there you go and a number two Morse taper center with I'm not sure what you call this device but the tail of the dog goes into this I'm a little disappointed that this is aluminum rather than steel, but it'll do the job. This dividing head can be set at different angles, so I've loosened up these two bolts, and there's a protractor right here. You can't really see it. Well, maybe you can. And it'll go, it'll knot itself by 10 degrees, and then it'll go any degree up to zero or ninety whatever you want to call that in the vertical position so that would be pretty useful however once you put a chuck on there it raises the height considerably so you have to have a machine at least as big as a bridge port to allow you clearance such that you can use this in the vertical position 
So I guess you can see the numbers pretty well. So I'm going to move it back down to zero best that I can and lock those two bolts. If you did not already understand this, and you probably did, when I said 40 to 1 ratio, that means there's 40 turns of the crank in order to turn the chuck or the work one full turn. There's two little levers on this side. This particular one is meant to lock it such that you can no longer turn this. In other words, you, you get your setting, you're going to make your cut, you would lock this so that it does not vibrate or move around during that cut and you would loosen it again before you made your next adjustment. We can do direct indexing with this head and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute but right now I wanted to show you this little pin right here and this lever will move the pin into any one of these 24 holes that you see around here for very easy direct indexing. As I said earlier there are a total of three plates and that allows you to produce just about any kind of gear with as many teeth or as few teeth as you can imagine and it probably can be done this with this device either with the direct or the indirect indexing. And I will talk a lot more about the indirect indexing in the follow-up videos where I actually cut a gear but in the little manual here toward the back there are tables that would help you select the the correct plate let's say it's uh, 36 teeth on your gear the correct plate and the correct number of divisions that you would find down here with this little spider but what I'm going to do right now is to take the crank off and this plate off so that I can uh, disconnect the worm in there and the, the worm gear such that we can do direct indexing and that's all under the plate so it's a bit of a pain to take that all off in order to do the direct indexing. Okay I've taken off the crank and the sector and the plate and there's an allen screw right there. Loosen that up and what that does is it allows me to swivel this so that I am disengaging the worm from the worm wheel. So with the screw loosened and this rotated counterclockwise as far as I can go you can see that the spindle is now totally free of the index plates and the crank and everything that goes on here. So we need that backed off in order to do direct indexing. Also the other purpose of this is so you can make an adjustment between the worm and the worm wheel to take up for wear and there is oil down in here as well. Almost like a little crankcase as far as I understand. Now on the 24 hole plate that's on here I will zoom in just a little bit and you're going to see that there are graduations on there for degrees. So that's zero degrees and we can rotate this now to, uh, well I'll go the other way. There's uh, 10 degrees, 20 degrees and so on until we come clear around and we get back to the starting point which would be 35 or, or 350 and that would be 360. So now I'm indexing by degrees and I'm not using this little pin. I'm using the needle right here, the brass needle. By the way, I don't really like this. It looks kind of cheap, but I suppose it'll work all right. For instance, if we wanted to to move 30 degrees, got to put my glasses on. So it'll be 10, 20, there's 30 degrees, and then a fellow would want to lock it before he made his cut, and this would be the lock. And we're not using this at the present time. Now, if for instance I wanted to cut a gear that had 12 teeth, and there are 24 holes here, I would start with hole number one, which is on the zero mark, and the pin is presently in that hole. I would keep it in there 
lock it, cut that first tooth, then unlock it, back the pin out, did you see it come out? And then I've marked these with a marker. Can you see that? And I think it's always a good idea to mark things. So that would be tooth one. And then I would skip one hole and go into the next one. And there might be a little wiggling necessary when you find the hole because this is a tapered pin in here. Lock it. And then we could cut tooth number two. And you can see how easy that is to do for gears or splines or whatever you might be cutting that were even and can be uh, divided into the, the 24. Okay, I'm giving you a close-up here of the pin, the tapered pin. Then you would rotate it to the next hole or whichever hole that might be and the pin should all come all the way through because it is tapered and then of course we would lock it. I'm going to put the same plate on off camera, but before I do, remember to loosen up this screw and we are re-engaging the worm. Adjust until it's snug and then I'll tighten this up and I'll double check it by putting the crank on here and make sure that it, the gears are actually fully engaged and there's no backlash. Okay, the dividing head is reassembled and all ready for indirect indexing and that will be shown in future videos. In regards to the little manual here, it's typical of what we get with Chinese goods. It's just not well worded and there's a lot of mistakes in it so you're pretty much on your own although there will be some benefit by reading this manual but you're better off watching my video two or three times. Well, that concludes part one of my video series on the Vivor index head. Be sure and watch as I release other ones over a period of time. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.